Uh, I'm Professor Kanan, and um, you too can have one of these shirts. Uh, I'm more happy to share. So, um, and I'm here to help with uh, sort of just the basic rudimentary uh, evidence in terms of preparing the, uh, the mock trial. Uh, Professor Schlahead, who I guess you saw yesterday or the day before yesterday, um, remind you of a couple of things. Uh, one was, I guess they added the uh, instruction on second degree murder. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that you're all not freaking out about that and that, you know, it might be a mouthful during opening statements and during closings to, to talk about it. Um, I would say, uh, from my point of view, the major difference is just like, did he intend to kill him or did he intend to, uh, uh, you know, act in a way that was in, in disregard of his uh, well-being. You know, did he intend to shoot him, or did he intend to kill him? Right? Uh, and I think we added the charge because it was a concern that, you know, uh, you might really have a hard time proving that he actually intended to kill him, um, but you might be able to prove that, you know, that he intended to shoot him. And so, for all intents and purposes, you shouldn't let that instruction you know, throw you for a loop or something like that. You know, you can just work it in however it makes sense to you to work in. And if you don't find that he's intending to kill him, then at least you should find that he's intending you know, to shoot him. There was no accident, whatever it is that you want to argue uh, in summation. The other thing was that I guess in talking about cross-examination, Professor Schwab had said he was worried. See, he worries about these things, right? Um, that's a good sign. Um, he was worried that he, that he was, didn't warn you against asking the so question, right? Um, one of the purposes of cross-examination is to establish a foundation to make an argument in submission. And if you ask somebody the so question, right, if you ask the witness the so question, you, know, you can sort of bring up a bunch of facts that would make it look, for example, on cross-examination of the defendant, that the defendant was uh, acting intentional, right? You know, you had threatened this, you had said this, you had done that, you had done that, you had done that. And then you establish those things, and then on summation, you would want to argue something like, somebody who did all those things, right, uh, it's going to be somebody who likely knew exactly what he was doing when he pulled out that gun, right? Um, that there was no accident, et cetera, et cetera. If you ask the so question after you've elicited the specific facts that you want, right, and so you intended to shoot him, what is the witness going to say? No, I didn't intend to shoot him. In fact, let me explain, right? Um, so just remember that very often on cross-examination, you want to focus on particular facts, right? And you want to make a show, if you will, about focusing on those facts. You know, excuse me, I know you want to try to explain this, right? I'm not asking you to explain this. You understand my question. I'm asking you whether you did this, OK? Um, and so you want that to establish those facts, and, and of course, you may use the witness's answers in summation. That was so anxious to explain away these facts because he knows that anybody who did those things, right, was doing this on purpose. Okay, so you know, he was, uh, you know, you notice he got up. He on you know, direct examination, they asked him questions, he gave answers. You know. I started asking questions on cross-examination and fought them all. Right. Uh, and you know, occasionally you might have to look for help from the judge, I'm sure Professor Fine talk to you about that, and you know, sort of ask the witness to just answer the question or object, move to strike everything after yes. Right is non responsive to my question. You know, if you now really focus the yes on the question, make it leading enough, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But you want to make sure, don't ask the so question. That's what summation is for. Okay, uh, you know, summation, you want to get up and you want to say, let's talk about the facts here, not the subtitles that the witness was trying to put underneath them. <laughs> you know, the kind of running explanation or, or, or whatever, all right? Um, so I think that covers the things, yes. So what the hell to do about evidence since 
don't know of any yet. Um, right? The answer is learn as much as you can as quickly as you can, I guess. Um, so a couple of basic points, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start walk, working through some of the examinations, and we'll talk about some of the issues that come up. Those of you who started looking at this, I assume you're going to have questions. Um, and, and I'm here to answer, you know, to answer them. So you should ask me that. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to be sharing them with everybody else, right, if you have a question. Okay. A couple of basic points. Um, so these depositions, I'm sure you have been told, they're not scripts. We're not hiring you to be actors and read the lines in the script. Right? Um, these depositions give you the information that the witness knows. So the witness knows from the answer to the question, that's what that witness knows, and reasonable inferences from, from that. You right? can't make things up off the wall, because you know your witness is going to get impeached anyway. If you, you know, make things up off the wall that are not in the deposition, all the witnesses have sworn that they've given all the information, that material information that they have about this case, right? So incidentally, that means if you're going to cross-examine them and they make something up, they say, okay, you didn't say this in your deposition, and you swore, right, that you had given all the material information, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can do that. But though these are not scripts, I don't know how to emphasize more than that. Um, this is what the witness knows, and you want to structure your examination to accomplish your purpose. So basically, use the depositions for, to know what the witness knows, and you think about how you want to listen. Okay? I know you've talked about this with about direct, and you've talked about cross a little bit, but I just want to sort of remind you in that fashion. When you are doing that, when you are kind of reconstructing the Q&As to accomplish your purpose, right? Remember that a lot of the reasonable inferences here often go to foundations. Foundations follows from certain basic rules about testimony. One of the most important is simply that witnesses get to testify to that which they have personal knowledge, right? They have to have personal knowledge of it. So when you're putting a witness on the stand, don't put the witness on the stand and say, you know, what happened at the scene of the accident, okay? What you put the witness on the stand is you establish first that the witness was there at the scene, that the witness could see, you know, all those kinds of things. So that is kind of communicating to the judge that the witness is about to be testifying from his personal knowledge or her personal knowledge, okay? So that's very important. And these foundations, they're not going to appear in hot verba, you know, uh, verbatim in here in the depositions or anything like that. But you're going to need to provide them. And very often they're just reasonable inferences. If the person was there, you establish that they were there, etc. Et Certain other things have foundations as well. You can look at the Federal Rules of Evidence, and uh, uh, 602 is the personal knowledge rule. You can look under. Um, the 900 series, 901, about things that need kind of foundation to authentication and stuff like that. Conversations, very important. Conversations need foundations and authentication, right? So there's kind of a standard way to do it. I guess you've been told you might want to look at Mallet, you know, trial techniques book. Have they been told that? I don't know, but if you, there are copies of Mallet and various other trial techniques books down in the, um, in the Moore Advocate's office, and you can stand where they can help you find a book or whatever it is. Um, and so basically, there's kind of a standard way to do it. The standard way to do it is, in fact, your way of communicating to the judge silently, right? Because this whole dance between you and the judge is going on in the courtroom uh, that you know what you're doing uh, and that you're satisfying the various rules of evidence. Right? The jury wouldn't know beans about what's going on. They just think it's kind of cool the way you're asking this question. It sounds like it must be really important because you ask all these foundation questions before you pop the question, like, so what do you say? <laughs> right? Um, but a conversation would be like, you know, sort of, um, who was there? Where was it? Approximately what time it was? Who it was, right? So, and the answer could just be, you know, it could be whatever it is. It's like, I don't know, 
don't remember, but sometime in the afternoon, in the afternoon, I was there, he was there, nobody else was there. Okay. Uh, and what did you say to you? What did you say to him? Right? Of course, it's a very important conversation. Um, I'm sure you've been taught the technique about how to like slow down the film and speed up the film, right? How do you slow it down? You slow it down by asking uh, a, a narrower question. You don't say, what did you say to him? What did you say to you? What was the first thing you said to him? Right? And what was the very next thing that he said to you? Right? And how did you reply? Uh, you know, you can take, I mean, there's kind of critical five seconds in this case, or 10 seconds in this case, right? It could be, Maybe, you know, two minutes worth of testimony. Yeah. The testimony could have made longer than the event, right? But why? Because that's critical. That's like that's like the you know the, the NFL replay at the end of the game. How many times do they show? You know, sort of over and over again. You can only do it once, but it's like you want to do it really, really slow so they get that sort of uh, that sort of thing. But you want to be communicating to the judge, you know, that sort of foundational question. And the most important foundational question, forget it, you don't know the rules yet. You might look at them, you're going to look up something it's like, what's the difference between how you do it in court and how you might tell a person's story? Well, very often we don't tell people how we know people. Right? We just sort of tell them what happened. In court, it's very critical that you know how it is that a witness purports to know something. Right? Does he know something from his own observation? Does he know something because somebody else told him it happened? Right? Well, then he doesn't really know it. That other person really knows it. He has first-hand knowledge of what the other person told him, but he doesn't have first-hand knowledge of the event. Okay? So that would be a hearsay statement. And there are going to be several in here that we're going to talk about in here. Students tend to be afraid of hearsay. They don't make up. It's a big hearsay objection. No. Uh, there are lots of exceptions to the hearsay rule. The most important one of which I'll just tell you right now is a statement of a party opponent. So basically, if you're the prosecutor in this case, anything that the defendant says, even though it may have been said out of court and it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, so I'll talk about later, but hearsay is. Uh, because it's a statement of the party. Okay? Uh, and there's going to be a lot of sort of back and forth between uh, uh, you know, the defendant uh, and the victim about their conversations uh, back and forth. All right? Um, so, so far, um, right, we're talking about foundations, and you might want to look, look for those. 602 and 901, all right? Um, we are talking where you're sort of focusing on how it is that the witness knows uh, what it is that they say that they know, okay? Um, we're going to be talking about hearsay, that most dreaded of uh, objections for beginning trial lawyers, because you actually have no little evidence to uh, respond, all right? Um, but here you might want to start a little list for yourself of exceptions. That's, yes, it's hearsay, Your Honor, but it's admissible because, okay? Um, and that, you can only sort of ask whether something is hearsay. Uh, yeah, question? No. Oh, it's <laughs> You can only ask whether something is hearsay until you focus on the personal knowledge of it, right? Is the person, because occasionally students will say like, well, if I don't ask the witness how it is the written what he knows, and I just had to get, get him to testify as if he saw it, right? But without saying that he saw it, we're just saying this happened, and it's all based on what someone else told him, well, then nobody will object to hearsay, right? So, but no, right? The other person's going to get up and say something you have to listen to me now and say something like, objection based on how he knows, depending on how he knows. And then the judge will look at it and say, how do you know? And so will somebody else call it. And then it's an objection. Right? And the other person will say, habada, 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 habada. And then it's an objection. Okay. Um, all right. So 
some other basic points that we're going to cover today. It's just based on looking at the transcript and put these are the kinds of things that might come up. Um, foundations in the matter of testimony hearsay. Um, what I would call sort of the general 403 question, which is probative value versus prejudice. some evidence that somebody is offering that is somewhat probative, uh, but your sense is that it's going to prejudice your case. By prejudice, I don't mean hurt your case. By prejudice, I mean unfairly hurt your case. Right? So it's like, objection, Your Honor, uh, that's too prejudicial because they saw him holding the smoking gun. That's not prejudice. That's what probative. All right? Um, the prejudice part is, you know, that uh, before he went down to uh, commit the crime, he beat his wife. Right? Well, maybe it's somewhat relevant in the idea that it shows he's a kind of violent guy, right? If he beat his wife, all things being equal, right? He'd be somewhat more likely than he would be without the evidence to beat somebody else or to act wildly to somebody else, right? But the prejudice, unfair prejudice part is now you're focusing the jury's attention on number what? Number one, hopefully an emotional reaction to beating your spouse, right? Getting angry at the person for doing it. Uh, and also, you're focusing them on the person's <coughs> character, which is to say, maybe we should convict him for what he did to his wife. Who cares whether he did this one or not, right? Or maybe he did one or the other. Right? Or just kind of, but basically focusing the jury's attention on something besides what the purpose of the trial is, right? The purpose of the trial is to answer the question of whether the elements of the offense have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. That's of this specific offense, right? We require that in this country, right? You know, you get indicted for a specific crime. It's not that you're a bad guy, it's not that you're just a member of a I was going to say it's not that you're just a member of a terrorist group, but you know, I don't know, conspiracies to undermine the United States. A little close, you know, the Smith Act, being a member of the Communist Party. You know, but those are, those are hicky cases, right? You don't have to worry about that one here, okay? It's whether he committed these specific acts. So you have to formulate your arguments in such a way that the probative value is not substantially outweighed by the potential and incidentally, if we only had one rule of evidence, that's what we have. Right? And you could, you could potentially accomplish largely the same thing, although, of course, you want to control judicial discretion and have much more particular rules to deal with specific kinds of situations. Then, along here, there are going to be rules about impeachment that are more particular by impeachment, we mean how do you attack somebody's credibility? And that's going to be very important simply because, in the context of this little trial, you know, how are you going to decide this case if you're a jury? You're going to have to decide who's telling you the truth, right? And remember, the, 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 you know, there's a tendency to think that the person who's not telling you the truth is lying, okay? There are lots of reasons why people don't tell you the truth that do not have to do with law. You know, lawyers talk about the testimonial capacities. In order to give an accurate testimony from the witness stand, one has to, number one, accurately observe, one has to accurately remember, one has to accurately sort of describe what it is, what you remember, and one has to at least try to be telling the truth, right? So we talk about narration, sincerity, um, memory, and perception. And guess what? Insincerity is only one of those four, right? So, for instance, you're going to, you've got um, a relationship between the law clerk and the judge here, where the law clerk's job is potentially dependent upon the judge. 
does that mean if you bring that out on cross examination that you are pointing out that the uh, you know law clerk is in here lying to save his job? Not necessarily. But you know, if so, you owe somebody your job, wouldn't you tend to see them as favorable, right? Wouldn't you tend to remember the favorable things that they do? Would your mind tend to put together events in a way that was favorable to them, right? Same thing with the relationship with a loved one or something like that. Not necessarily when they are lying, right? Or, you know, you may ride around in a car be in an accident with your spouse, right? And, you know, your spouse is a really, really careful driver. But guess what? Even careful drivers occasionally, what? Have accidents and make mistakes, right? So your mind is going to sort of put it together in a certain way. There can be all kinds of things, right? So your memory is going to remember in a way, your perception is going to be a certain way, your, you know, there are all those things. That's all fodder for submission, right? But that's all part of this here. Right? Impeachment is just not about inconsistent statements or, uh, or whatever. Okay? So these are kind of the areas that I would say, and there aren't going to be too many here say questions here. There'll be a couple, right? Um, there'll be, there'll be, I think, probably more of these questions about what you do in impeachment. And then obviously for your whole uh, examination, you, you should be thinking about foundations. Incidentally, you have to think about foundations from both sides, which is to say you've got to be very careful sometimes with witnesses. Uh, if you call the witness on direct, and then somebody is cross-examining the witness now, and they ask these kind of cross-examination questions. They used to drive me crazy when people were cross-examining my witness. Uh, but in fact, uh, can be very effective, right? Uh, you'd agree with me that, right? Well, a question like that on cross-examination, maybe the witness would agree with you, but it has nothing to do with anything that the witness observed through his personal knowledge, right? You'd agree with me that the defendant was wearing blue, a blue suit that day. Right? Well, you've got to train your witness to say, well, I don't know, I didn't see what the person was saying, rather than say, the person was wearing a blue suit that day because they heard somebody else say that. Right? Because the, the whole record may be mucked up with all these inconsistencies because the witness has said, well, no, I'd agree with that, I'd agree with that, I'd agree with that, I'd agree with that. It has nothing to do with what I actually saw. It can be a cross examiner's favorite technique in terms of muddying up the record. You have to. You have to Object in a way that reminds your witness. Say, objection, you know, is this question about personal knowledge or what he observed or whatever? And you know what? Even if the ju judge overrules the objection, at least you have reminded your witness that then now your witness will take the cue and say something like, oh, I didn't see who he was. I've heard you say who he was. I don't know what Okay. All right. So you want to start with. Um, our judge witness. If not, I'll say a few things. I mean, unless you want to sort of ask some questions. If those of you who started work on this, you know, you're looking at it from from your perspective, which is going to be better than mine, right? Because it's hard for me to put my shoes back into somebody who's doing this to me. Uh, put my feet back into the shoes of somebody who's doing this for the uh, for the first time. All right, so it's up to me. Okay. Um, first thing you find in the beginning of the deposition, right, is this question about whether there's been a complaint about the judge before. Okay. Um, and what might you think about if you're the person who's thrown the judge, who is the victim in this case? Maybe you wouldn't want the jury to, to know what. that there was this complaint about the judge, right? What's the relevance of the complaint about the judge? Uh, uh, being reprimanded for bullying some
somebody into um, Where's the drug dealer from? Oh, the guy's growing marijuana. Okay. Growing marijuana. Medical marijuana. Right, so if we look at that, it's it's lopsided. So what you want to do is want to make the You want to sort of dirty him up a little bit, right? That he's not a that he's not a great judge. Okay. All right, so what are you gonna to want to do from the other side if you are uh, uh, if you're calling? You don't want that to come in, okay? Right now, if there were no specific rule about impeachment, you would start talking about what? Probably value versus prejudice, right? The bearing of this bullying uh, on his credibility is fairly minimal, right? Uh, it is prejudicial because it's going to think that the jury say, "Well, maybe this guy got what he deserved." Right? You know, if he's the kind of person to be engaged in this activity, whatever. There are more specific rules on impeachment, though, under the federal rules, right? The federal rules will allow you to inquire into other acts of a witness who, incidentally, has not been convicted of a crime, and nobody's convicted of a crime here. If those acts go to the credibility of that person's witness, their character for truthfulness, OK? Um, and the rule is 608B, so you're going to want to take a look at that, all right? Um, 608B has a very, very specific solution to this problem. These are the bad acts that we're going to allow you to go into of a prior bad acts of a witness on the issue of his credibility. Only those that actually go to truth tell, right? Sort of acts of lying, acts of embezzlement. Right? It says dishonesty or false statement, but if you read the advisory committee notes, it really leans towards the false statement and not towards the dishonesty. Okay? So you're going to want to take a look at 608 and say, well, you know, is this really an act of dishonesty? So should you be able to ask about it at all? And that's an argument. Right? The argument is that he bullied this guy. Okay? Right, so you know, I mean, it's sort of abuse of judicial power, but it doesn't really go to a propensity to, to speak falsely. Uh, also, he denies it. He denies that he did something wrong. So now you have a question of if he, you were allowed to ask the question, and he denies it, could you try to prove it with other evidence? Turns out in this little problem, you have no other evidence other than what you would say. Right? But in any event, 608B has something to say about that. It says that you can't use extrinsic evidence. You can ask the question. Right? <laughs> but once the witness says no, that's it. You're stuck. Right? You might try to be, be sneaky and come along and say, yeah, but you were found to have done this. But that is actually extrinsic evidence, and it's also hearsay. Because it's basically that the investigators found that you did it. Right? But I'm putting that out there for you, so I'm telling you you should try to do it. You can, you know, thank you. You're going to make your own choice. This is what the great thing is. You're learning how to be lawyers. You're going to make your own choices. You're going to lose. All right? I hope you guys learn how to be ethical lawyers. Uh, on the one hand, I don't want to tell you not to follow the rules of evidence because there, unfortunately, has, um, what I would say, um, more irrelevant in the natural courtroom than I would rather they be. So I'm not, certainly not going to tell you not to follow them. But on the other hand, uh, I don't want you to be the only people out there who are engaging in a fair fight. And other people that want to go over with their and sticks. Whatever, right? Uh, OK? Um, so I'm telling you that's out there. Now, you may be a little bit creative. You may be a little bit creative. Well, what's creative? He denies that he bullied the defendant, the defendant in that case. But he was found to have done it. Maybe the question that you want to ask is not whether he did it, but whether at this investigation he spoke falsely about doing it. 
Now it's starting to sound, right, like a prior lie, right? You were investigated, right, and you denied bullying, that, and that was false, wasn't it? Now, he's still going to deny that it was false, but the bottom line is now you've got a better opportunity to get that question in under 608B, inquire into specific instance of untruthfulness, right? Because it's about his having spoken falsely, okay? Uh, and the jury gets the waft, gets the gist of that, okay? And then, you know, he may, he may deny it or whatever it is. I mean, he will deny it, I think, because he, you know, there's no basis for him to do something. Other than that, then you ask the question in that way, and you say, I have a good faith basis to ask the question. My good faith basis for asking Because you, you need a good faith basis to ask any of these questions about the prior act of wrongdoing. You can't just walk up and say, you know, isn't it true that you strangled your dog, right? I mean, or just make stuff up, right? You need to have a good faith basis for it. Uh, and the judge will demand that, but your good faith basis is he was found to have done this and he had an opportunity to speak uh, with his behalf at the hearing and we know he's denied. Right. How do we know he's denied? Because he's still denying it yet. Right? If he says, I didn't deny it, I admitted it, and he denies it now, then you can say, so you lied at the hearing. <laughs> right? So either way you got it, at least on that. Okay. This is the kind of analysis. I'm trying to point you to the rules and get you to start thinking about it. Not great at the end of the day. What would you do strategically if you are the prosecutor in this case and you think these questions may come up? But this is a kind of question that you might make a motion and limit before the beginning of the trial. Do they have an opportunity to do that? Yeah, you've got an opportunity to make a public motion and limit, right? I mean, they're not gonna, I mean they're, you know, the whole thing is time limited. You want to, but you know what? Before they get up and start asking this question, you might want to demand the good faith basis and say, I anticipate that they're going to do this. Why? Because it was in the earlier uh, deposition. And I want to uh, exclude this. A motion of limit means a motion to exclude before trial. And I want to get my ruling now so they don't get the opportunity to ask the question in the presence of the jury. Okay. Notice from an evidentiary point of view, you've got to be careful. If you succeed in getting it out, don't put the judge on the stand and say it's, and get him to testify that he has a perfect record. Because then you've done what? You've opened the door to the evidence that you've kept out, right? In other words, keeping out the evidence doesn't allow you to prove affirmatively the opposite. Right? It just means they can't go into it, you can't go into it. And even as late as summation, don't find yourself saying, and you didn't hear anything, we got the drug dealers against the judge, and you didn't hear anything that the judge has ever done wrong, in which case, opposing parties should move and say they've opened the door, even in summation, it's time to reopen the evidence, and then you get up and you say, oh, and now, jury, you will hear about what the judge has done wrong. You don't want that now. Okay? Um, God, it's getting late. Okay, so that's one example on, um, uh, on impeachment. Um, you also, with this particular judge, uh, you know, you might want to talk about some aspects of this deal, there were sort of some shady potential aspects of this deal, right, where he was sort of abetting this person in terms of disguising his involvement in the deal, right? Uh, okay. Um, so should we talk a little bit, I'm trying to think of a good example for, um, uh, for, all right, here's a good one in terms of foundation, okay? The end of the, um, who, uh, the uh, judge's testimony, do you believe that the defendant was trying to kill you on December such and such? Right? Um, it's a relevance of what he believes. He was there. So? So he could have at least some sense of what the other person was doing right in front of him. Okay. All right. So uh, take a look at Rule 701. 
It's about um, lay opinions, right? It's when you're giving a kind of conclusory opinion about, right, do you believe he was trying to kill you or whatever. It may or may not be admissible depending on whether you've been able to lay a foundation of two things. One is that the person had um, an opportunity to, you know, it's, been, it's rationally based on the perceptions of the witness. And that's where your argument comes in, right? He was there, he saw it happen. You know. But the second part is, is it um, helpful? Is it really helpful to the juror? Right? Uh, and then the question you have to ask yourself is, once he has described all the actions that the defendant did, what does it add? for him to say, I think he was trying to kill him, right? You've got to think about, does it add something? Does it like, you know, sometimes we think of like a wink or a blink. Describe a wink, describe a blink. You describe them, they, they look like, it would sound like exactly the same thing. Do we know the difference between when somebody just blinks or when we're being winked at? Usually we do, right? So, you know, the conclusion is, whether it was a wink or a blink, you can only get so far with describing what it is that the person did, so it adds something, based on a rational perception and helpful to the trier of fact. You have to ask that question. Is it really helpful? Okay? Is it something that, is it communicating something that couldn't otherwise be communicated? From the other point of view, you might think about, gee, is that really helpful? Does that really help me to have the judge up here saying, he was trying to kill me, he was trying to kill me, right? Well, so how does he know? Whether he's trying to kill him, or he's trying to injure him, or, right? Uh, or maybe, you know, or, or, or do you want the jury to draw that conclusion based on your presentation of all the evidence, rather than having the judge up here saying, he's trying to kill me, he's trying to kill me, which makes it sound like the judge is an axe to in all of this, right? You've got to make that. That's a more kind of strategic choice. Uh, but that's a, another foundational rule that uh, up here you're going to hear about, you know, conclusory testimony or lay opinions. That's what's up. That's what's up here. I think probably the um, hearsay. Let me get to the one that's going to be the most. I think the most uh, uh, problematic. Not problematic. I don't know. They're all, you know, you guys are going to know probably wrong with it. But um, one that I think it will help you make, uh, help you at least understand the concept. On page 40, we've got the defendant's testimony. Okay? Um, the defendant is talking to the EM about, they're not sure how much time has gone by since the shooting, but it's fairly shortly afterwards. And the defendant is saying, uh, would want to offer the EMT's testimony that the defendant told the EMT, oh my God, Peyton had a gun, I was going to get shot, oh my God, what have I done, oh my God, please help, I never meant to. Right? Now, hearsay is an out-of-court statement that is offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Right? Even though the person who made that out-of-court statement is also going to testify at the trial, the defendant here, okay? If you are using his out-of-court statement to prove that the judge had a gun, that he believed he was going to get shot, because that's the relevant part, not whether he was going to get shot, uh, I never meant to hurt anyone, right? The defendant's kind of exculpatory story about what happened being made to the EMT, that's his. Because that statement was not made in the presence of the trier of fact, 
It's not under oath. It's not immediately capable of being cross-examined. So the EMT only has personal knowledge of what the defendant told him. And the purpose of eliciting it through the EMT, right, the EMT is just simply having heard him utter those words, is not probative. What's probative is, is, is if you use those words for the truth of the matter asserted. Okay? That's the definitional section of hearsay is under 801. So notice what you have is you have the EMT who is in court who is relating a statement made by the defendant that you're using for the truth of the matter asserted. Right? If the, rele if the relevant part of it were simply that the defendant had uttered those words, right? then it wouldn't be hearsay. Because the only person whose credibility would count would be the EMT. And he's here testifying in court subject to cross-examination of the rule, all that kind of stuff. But if the EMT is telling us what the defendant said, and you want to use what the, the, the assertion made by the defendant for the truth of the matter asserted, right? And that depends upon the defendant's credibility. And although the defendant is testifying elsewhere at trial, that particular statement was not made in the presence of the trier of that, not subject to immediate cross-examination, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, didn't you tell me a statement of a party opponent is an exception to hearsay? The answer is yes. But when the defendant elicits the defendant's out-of-court statement, that's not a party opponent. When the prosecution elicits the defendant's statement, that's a party opponent. The prosecution wants to keep this statement out because the, you know, in summation you want to say, well, you know, not only did he tell you what happened here, he told the EMT exactly what happened as well moments after the time, right? Here, the prosecutor wants to keep it out and basically say, he came in here, he knows his ass is on the line, right? What do you expect him to say? And then, in fact, there's an inconsistency between what he says uh, and what the law clerk says that he said uh, at one point or another, which you might want to exploit and say something like, you know, he couldn't even keep his story straight, right? Uh, whatever. Okay? Now, having said that, this is the end there are some, there are lots of hearsay exceptions. There are, you know, uh, many of like the 30s or something like that. So, and I expect that you would have it all memorized by uh, Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, my, my father used to look laugh at me. Oh, we know your folks. Right? So, uh, so, but there are many, and you want to scan them. You know, if you were the defendant, you would scan them on each other. At least I find them. You go back and sort of look at the context in which the statement was made, and you might want to take a look at 8033. I'm watching these guys over here, I'm getting some big spots. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were thinking, right? Um, you might want to take a look at 8033, uh, which is uh, a hearsay statement for what's called an excited utterance. All right, so there, for the excited utterance, there may be a set of foundational rules, right? Was, the, was this statement made uh, concerning, uh, 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 under stress or excitement uh, in response to a startling event or condition, et cetera, et cetera? But you're going to look at the rule, and you can, you, know, you can look at a manual if you want or whatever, but you'll see that there could be like you know, four elements or whatever there are in the excited utterance. Those become the foundations for the hearsay exception, all right? Now, notice as a matter of um, introducing this statement from the, uh, the, from the defendant's point of view, because you've learned to introduce it, you're going to want to try to make clear to the judge your basis for introducing it before you 
introduce it, right? I mean, on the other hand, you know, if you just because if you just say, and what did you hear the defendant say? You know, you're going to get a hearsay objection, and at that point, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to say, well, I offer to prove that this is admissible as an excited utterance, and then you're going to have to go back and try to lay the foundation for it. If you want to exclude the rat, what you might want to do is you want to say, did you have an opportunity to talk to the defendant afterwards? You know, the EMT when you arrived on the scene, the answer is yeah. Okay. Without telling us what you what he said to you, can you tell us to describe his tone of voice? Right? Can you describe, you know, um, uh, his uh, emotional state? Right? Um, you know, did he did, was he explaining anything at the time? And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Right? That's not going to be hearsay because that's like not for the truth of the matter asserted. Right? That's like, there's got to be a funny line in there somewhere about like atheists and believers about you know, whether it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Uh, whatever. But okay. Um, so to the extent you can, you're going to try to ask those questions and then say, you know, and while he was explaining and screaming and well, it's things that you can kind of infer from the, the exclamation point, the, the, the notion of the, whatever it is that he's all excited and all this, right? Then you're going to say, okay, now I'm going to offer this. And you say, objection here, so I'm going to some All right. Uh, and then the judge might rule right there, or he might want to ask the following questions, or he might want to say, let's just speak to the jury and then just to the witness. From the point of view of the prosecutor, if they get to the excited utterance point, what do you want to do? You want to show that it's not an excited utterance. Wait a minute, right? They can't establish that this was shortly after the event, right? So if he had time, you think of the purpose of the excited utterance uh, exception, he had time to concoct the story, right? It was up to him. We have no timeline between the shot and when he was ready to talk to the EMT. Even once he called the EMT later on, right? And what is he talking about? He's not talking about help this man who's bleeding down there. It's like it's like I didn't do it, right? So it's like, is he consciously reflecting, or are these words sort of being impelled out of it because he's still in this statement of uh, shock, in this state of shock, right? And that's what you want. And you know what? At the end of the day, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some on that, and whatever it is, it is. Um, going back to your opening statement, for, in, for instance, before you get a ruling on that, you may not want to um, open on it because you don't know whether you're going to be able to prove it or not, unless you've already got a ruling on it. Is there a question? Just stretching your arms? Um, questions, comments, whatever? There's also uh, uh, more on the sort of hearsay point here. There's a lot of stuff that um, the judge is going to be uh, describing uh, about his conversation with the defendant. You now already know that if you are eliciting that from the judge and the prosecutor, anything the defendant says, statement of a party opponent, right? So that's the easy way. You don't have to worry about it, whether it's being offered. From the testimony of the defendant, there's going to be a lot of talk about their conversations, right? About the threats, et cetera, et cetera, OK? Um, going back and forth. A lot of that you know, could potentially get you're saying, you know, people sort of instinctively tend to object. Somebody out of court is speaking with like objection hearsay, right? Um, you get a lot of that, but often if it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, then there's no hearsay problem, right? And a lot of it is, you know, uh, you're not trying to prove the details of the agreement that they had. You're not trying to litigate whether they really owed the three thousand dollars or they didn't owe the three thousand dollars. A lot of the talk is being offered just you know, from, from what the judge said for its um, context and its effect on the listener, right? His having told him that sort of explained why it is that he went back to try to demand his money. Because he said, I don't owe it. He's not trying to prove whether he owed it or he didn't owe it, right? It's just all that, right? 
There's another hearsay exception that I'm going to go to. Uh, uh, you know what? I can't believe it. I used the word all this time. <laughs> Thank you. Is that, that was the It's 8032, because I was in for excited utterance. 8033 is the state of mind exception. All right? Sorry about that. Um, that may be. <laughs> So, uh, 8033 is a good one to know, too, right? Because sometimes, um, you know, we can't read people's minds. So when people describe how they are thinking or what they know or whatever at the moment that they purport to be thinking that or they know, right, you know, um, they're really sort of the most direct evidence of what's there, what they know, what they're thinking. So there's a hearsay exception that allows that, all right? But it's more limited than you think, okay? Um, it's, you can use it to prove the belief or understanding of the declarant, the hearsay thing, but not to prove the truth of the belief. If you could use it, if you could make an argument in the following form, I'm just offering the statement to prove what the witness, you know, I mean, what the out-of-court uh, declarant um, uh, knew at the time, right? And then you say, well, why did they know that? Why did they believe that? Why did they remember that? Because it must be true. Well, then you might as well do away with the hearsay, right? If you can take that two step. But what's in your mind, right, you can use the hearsay exception to prove. And the reason why I say that is because that's important, right? What's important here is, for example, uh, you know, what the two parties believe about what the other was intending to do. And there are statements that they make out of court about that. They, what they believed about the transaction, whether the money was owed or whether the money wasn't owed or whatever, all those. But again, Right? Those might come in under 803. If you don't care about whether the money was really owed, if you don't care about whether they really meant the threat or not, but it was simply like, I believe that I had been threatened. <laughs> right? Uh, as I stated out here, like, for example, coming by law Okay? Um, Yes, so, so going back to, do you believe the defendant was trying to kill you? Would that fall under the state of mind uh, rule? Yeah, if his state of mind was relevant, right? Um, I mean, it would not fall under the state of mind rule because it's not a hearsay statement at all. It's not a statement made out of court. It's being asked in court. So it doesn't raise a hearsay question, right? If he had sort of at the time said something like, you know, you're trying to kill me. <laughs> Right, then you may have had to resort to the hearsay exception. But you don't need to go to a hearing at all, because he's just being asked about it on the stand. It's yeah. not a claim that he made in that right? And if it were a claim that he made in his deposition, it would be a backward-looking statement, in which case he would be talking about not his then-existing state of mind, but his prior state of mind. That's not covered by the exception. It's only the then-existing state of mind. Okay. Um, yes? Are only words that are said out loud considered hearsay, or can documents also be considered documents hearsay? Documents definitely also hearsay. So you want you want to take a look at some of the documents. What are your yeah? I mean, so what are your, what are your questions about um, about some of the documents? Right? I'm not I'm not going to tell you again. This is uh, the judge speaking. Stop calling me, or you will regret it. Your calls and threats are killing my judicial career, and I will not spend time. Right? You and I both know that I don't owe you any more money. It's just extortion. So leave me alone, or I will see to it that you never bother uh, anyone uh, again. Okay? Hearsay? You have a hearsay problem here? What do you think? What's the relevance of it? It's an 
out of court statement by someone not the defendant, right? So if it's, no. if it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, you've got a hearsay problem, right? What if this is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted? Do you care about whether the calls and threats are killing my judicial career? Not, right? Uh, not really, right? Uh, from the point of view, this is the defendant who would be offering this now, right? You might care about whether he believed his judicial career was being killed, in which case you have 8033, which is described in his then existing state of mind, right? He believes that this guy's behavior is threatening his judicial career, right? That might help explain why it is that he would do something as desperate as go to the public government, which is apparently what he is claiming, right? The rest of it, or most of the rest of it, um, how is it important? bother anyone again. Again, that might be state of mind. I was able to never bother anyone again, right? In other words, I actually had intended to do something that would shut you up, okay? Because if, if he's intending to do it, it's more likely that he did do it, okay? Which is going for a gun, all right? But also, you might also look at that and say, but even apart from that aspect of it, it's relevant simply for the fact that those are, even if he didn't believe any of that, who felt threatened having read it? Why don't you say, can he say that it's a party opponent? Yeah, I mean, sorry. Oh, he could, he yeah. could say it's a party opponent, but I thought we were sort of doing the, doing, doing the hearsay. Yes, you absolutely could do that. It's going to be potentially, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not a party opponent. This is the judge, right? No. I'm sorry. I, yeah. So this is the judge writing, so... Yeah, the judge is not the party. The party is the United States, or, or the state. Yeah. So, basically, we can say that he felt very Yeah, right? So, in other words, even if you didn't use those, those words for the truth, for their impact on the reader here, his feeling, right, which may explain why it is that he pulled his gun, right? Because he had already heard this threat. And then you can also use it for those pieces in there about his then existing uh, uh, state of mind about you know, you're killing my career, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to tell you again, if you want to be really technical about it, if the, those words actually include a backward looking statement. I told you this before. If you were using it to prove that I told you that before, that existing state of mind would not cover it because you would be using his memory to prove the truth of the thing. As I told you before, it's not the that that existing state of mind. But again, that's a sort of technical. I'm just trying to show you how you, how you try to uh, analyze it. Okay? Um, okay, you've also got authenticity. Is that what, should I talk about that with the documents a little bit? What's that? It's stipulated authentic. It's stipulated authentic, all right, but there's still some sort of like, um, uh, well, it, it can't be stipulated authentic because he denies that he ever wrote the note, right? Judge, the, the judge denies writing exhibit B right. himself. Okay. Right, so it can't be stipulated authentic, right, so in terms of admissibility. So how would you authenticate the note? If you were the um, the defendant, uh, the, the clerk uh, recognizes the handwriting. And again, when you get to the 900 series rule, it'd be a whole thing on handwriting that you can set familiarity with handwriting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So you would. I mean, you know how to. I think they you talked a little bit about how to do this. And, you know, do you recognize it? How do you recognize it? I recognize it. Judges can't write it, you know, how the point you work with them, I think it's all right. Okay? Um, there is it, I, I, you tell me, you know, what else I'm missing. I know there's a, 
there, there, there are real, some real questions about the admissibility of some of the pictures of guns just because of, there's, there's sort of some gaps in there about, you know, uh, think of, think of um, the testimony about who can say what, where did the police get them from, right? Where did they come from? Uh, who saw them? Was there an opportunity to move them? Or are they in the same way? At the end of the day, I'm not so sure how probative they are uh, one way or the other. All right? I, I think we've got about two minutes. So, right? So, if there's um, anything more, then um, you guys have to tell me. So, is there anything? All right, you might think about in terms of all the relevance, the defense uh, stuff, you know, uh, growing marijuana, cash business, all this kind of stuff. Um, should, uh, should the government be allowed to, prosecute, be allowed to listen to that about the defendant in terms of probative value, prejudice, does it go to credibility, et cetera? person to have committed this crime because their, you know, criminal type is shown by whatever it is, this act of untruthfulness. No, you can only address their character for truthfulness as a witness if that was the theory that you came So when you win an objection, you know, if the judge says it comes in for a limited purpose, like sometimes words may come in under the hearsay rule 
not for the truth of the matter asserted. If they don't come in for the truth of the matter asserted, you can't use them for the truth of the matter asserted, right? So this is not here, so Your Honor, not for the truth. I'm not coming in for the truth. It's just to show that he made an inconsistent statement on the subject, for example. You can't argue the truth of the out-of-court statement. It's hard to do evidence in, a, in a, um, an hour. Uh, but then again, I guarantee you that once you go through this process, once you do take the course, uh, things are going to mean a hell of a lot more to you because it will actually be, you know, you'll be learning a tool that you actually already used, uh, which I think is always the best way to do it rather than to sort of sit around and talk about it. Motions in the mini before trial, you mean? Right. Yes. I think, I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Right? You get up at the beginning and just say, Your Honor, before we start, I have some motions in the you know, after you're done with the Okay? Very often, and don't be upset about it, but very often judges will say, I'll see how it develops. I'm not going to rule you. But don't roll over. Like, don't mean that. That doesn't mean that you lost. It means, you know, you knew your objection. Your Honor, I anticipate that they are going to ask such and such a witness this, or they will elicit evidence of his judicial misconduct file or something like that, and I ask to exclude that. It all depends on your basis for exclusion, right? If it's, if it's any evidence of this particular fact because the fact is prejudicial, phrase it that way. If it's not a matter of any evidence, but you're trying to just exclude hearsay, like maybe the point they could prove in many other ways, you won't exclude testimony that so and so said this out of court has hearsay. But as a strategy, does it really make sense to early on? At the beginning. That? What's that? To right. It's usually a pretty good idea because you, you know, your attitude, I know this sounds crazy. But your attitude when you walk into a court and try a case would be, I have been an educated judge about it. And you're like, what do I know? The answer to that is, even if you're a beginner, you know so much more about your case than the judge does. You've boned up on the rules that actually impact your case. And you've thought through how your facts interact with your rules. So your attitude when you come in should be, I need to educate the judge about this to make sure he gives the right ruling. Okay? So, um, you know, you might want to use motions in limine to educate the judge about what's likely to happen. Um, I don't think at that late stage, you know, it's, it's quite strategic to be sitting on that and worrying about showing your hand to the other side. Uh, it's now time to put up the trial, and you've got a record on the field. It's also helpful because the motions eliminate don't count against your time during the competition. That doesn't mean you go crazy in every, you know, <laughs> you know, you pick a couple and you go at it. And incidentally, if there are ever like three reasons for why something should be excluded, talk about them one at a time. Because if you get up and say, here are the three reasons why it should be excluded, the rules of primacy and recency that they, the judge is either going to talk about number one or he's going to talk about number three, and the other two are just going to get lost, and you're going to forget them too. So what you do is you talk about number one, and then if you lose on number one, then you go to number two. And if you lose on number two, then you go to number three. Right? And if the judge says, you're wearing my patience thin, then you say, you know, Sorry, but you know, uh, uh, that's what I've got to do. It's my job, right? To sort of make these objections and perfectly appropriate for me to make these objections, right? Uh, and guess what? You might wear them now, right? But look, you're a professional. You know, you've got to get up and you've got to protect your record. It's the basis to make the motion you make. Now, just because you can object doesn't mean you do object. That's like the next level of sophistication, which is to say, like, sometimes. You know, you get up, that's completely objectionable, but you know the witness is going to give an answer that helps you. In which case, you have to learn to sit on your hands, just like they do. So, um, good luck to all of you. I hope you have a lot of fun.